Uh, find your own ways to honor the earth on this new moon, Earth Day. So I'd also like to just announce that Eve and I have a workshop coming up on Saturday. It's on mind training or lojong in Tibetan, which means to uh, train the mind, uh, cultivate the heart of compassion. And this is not a full day long because we, of course, want to respect people's screen time limitations. So we've created it in a way that I feel is very digestible. It begins at 10 a.m. on Saturday, this Saturday. 10 a.m. to 12 will be a silent session where we're guiding in meditation, uh, self-written reflections, uh, simple movements. I'll guide you through some simple yogic movements accessible to everyone. And then we'll have a break from 12 to 1.30. And then at 3, 1.30, we'll come back for two more hours until 3.30. And we'll guide practice again, but we'll also have small group discussions and teachings uh, to help us cultivate skill-based strategies for applying these teachings to everyday life. So we invite you to come and join us. That's donation-based and we'll be on Zoom. I'm assuming the same Zoom link here. So all are welcome to that, all levels, all new experience people everyone is welcome thank you eve thank you chandra and thanks everyone really wonderful to be um in this shared space it really truly is shared even if we're not physically in the same location and this evening i'm really looking forward to us introducing uh long awaited this wonderful book uh, for you all that Chandra and I will start talking about. We can share a bit more about it. And um, before we get started, I am going to just share one thing with you all, just one piece of written information. Um, and this is a, a simple slide here that I, I think is quite helpful. Um, these are by no means agreements or ideas I came up with on my own. This is ancient wisdom. These are called the paramitas are the spiritual qualities that really help us on the path. And they also really help us on the path of being online yogis. <laughs> it's a different format being here together like this. And uh, as Chandra and I and Katie have noticed some of the amazing benefits in terms of being able to be together while in our pajamas with the tea that we like without having to leave our house. There are some drawbacks and limitations as well. And so I'm just gonna invite you to consider and reflect upon these as we engage together. One of the big ones um, of the paramitas, sometimes called effort, um, also is called discipline. And, and this one I actually think is especially useful for us as we're in our cozy environments. It can be a little bit easy to kind of turn off our camera and then make a cup of tea and then maybe organize our kitchen drawer and then go into another room. And this is all during the meditation, right? Not even in the Dharma talk. So I really invite you to conduct yourself and have the discipline as though you were in a shared room together, to bring that integrity and that dignity of practice. So give yourself this opportunity to have no other distractions. You know, maybe if possible, close your email, close your texts and really be here present with us and, and see what that's like. That really dovetails beautifully with the generosity of giving yourself this time completely to be here. You're showing up with all of us as a community. Um, I do invite you to keep your camera on as a generosity of presence. If you're tired of looking at the screen, I get it. Even if you're just kind of like in a side view, but just so that we can see you, that will help you hold your discipline. So I invite you to indeed keep your camera on. That will really help you keep um, keep yourself in place together for this precious and short amount of time we have together to uh, really engage with these teachings and practices. I also invite non-harming. That is always something that's at the core of every practice. How can we be less harmful to ourselves with inner aggression as well as um, with one another? And in this environment where um, many of us don't know each other and in fact there's in some ways less consequence than we're in person. Just inviting you to watch your speech, watch your mind, and of course, watch any behaviors and chat or otherwise, and really consider that for many of us, this ongoing drag of pandemic is painful in so many different ways. And it elicits all sorts of weird emotional states 
Um, so notice that for yourself and be compassionate towards others who may or may not be um, as aware of how they're engaging or interacting. And maybe um, almost as important as the very last one, patience. Patience with us, patience with others. It's, it's really not like being in person. And I really miss being with you all. I really do. Um, and, you know, it's easy to be like, oh, God, I couldn't hear what they said. The internet broke out. This sucks. Right? And to just give ourselves a, um, a bit of that patience as a true practice. Working with our irritation, patience is our number one tool. So here's a great time to be exercising it. And then lastly, and most importantly, joyful enthusiasm. That is at the heart, that is the fire of our practice. And when we engage in that joyful enthusiasm, then we can learn to be with whatever is here that is wonderful. Um, and in these times, as we will um, get into a bit through our reading today, there is joy. Um, there, there is joy, unusual gifts are being given to us. So those are the paramitas. I am going to look at you all and will you nod if you think like, yeah, I'm into that. I think that's cool. Thank you all. The San Francisco Dharma Collective really prioritizes a sense that people can feel welcome, uh, included and understood. That's a really high bar. That's a hard one, but that's our aspiration. The Dharma is truly radical and transformative and um, we want that to be something which we can all um, engage with and all feel supported in. So that's our aspiration for you tonight. We're going to go ahead and get started in a practice. And this is a practice I have adapted a little bit. Um, and it is a practice by the teacher who we will be reviewing the text tonight. He is a contemporary Tibetan teacher. His name is spelled in a very funny way, but it is Sokni Rinpoche. And Sokni Rinpoche, he spent um, the last 30 years actually teaching in, um, and the last 20, especially in 25 probably, in the West. And he always says himself that he spent the good first part of that teaching to the head. People wanted to know and fill their head with these amazing practices of clarity and attention. And then he realized about 15 years ago that there was just no purpose that without being able to teach to the feelings, to the subtle body, that people had no capacity to really hold on to those teachings at the cognitive level. And so a practice that he really pioneered and designed in order to help us work with some of those blockages is called the practice of the handshake with emotion. And it's a handshake with emotion. It isn't as though we indulge and engage and lose ourselves within the emotional process. But it also isn't as though we are slamming it and putting it away and suppressing it and trying to, oh, get out of here. We don't want you. So it's neither an embrace nor an avoidance. It's a meeting, a shaking hands with our emotions. And to him, he has found that this practice is really useful as a preliminary, a way to set up so that we might do some of those practices really focused on clarity of mind. And in and of itself, it can be a wonderful practice for developing our conscious awareness. Already my co-teacher would like to introduce himself. Hello everybody. Um, he's a great teacher of relaxation and ease. So if you're ever, um, if you're ever needing that, a good cat can really show you how to do that. And so with Sokni Rinpoche's practice of handshake with emotion, we open up to what is here right now. We don't have to generate or construct anything. And the last thing I'll say before we just go ahead is this practice really is intended to help us identify what is called in Tibetan Buddhism as our subtle body. And some of you are familiar or very familiar with subtle body practices. If that is not a term you've ever heard, um, it really relates to the in-between, what is our kind of cognitive mental capacity, and then our kind of gross physical body. So in between the thinking mind and the physical body, so in between being hungry and angry, there is a felt sense in our body. All of us know that, we're aware, there is an experience there. Anyone who's done traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, of course. Um, oh, I like someone wrote hangry. Yes, then there's the beautiful combination of physical body and emotions. 
But this subtle body is when we start to tune in to this level of our body in which there's a kind of porousness. In the Western psychological world, where I do a lot of research and work, um, we are looking at this as how, in some ways, the mental preoccupations or stress gets under the skin. So we know that there's physical impacts to what's going on in our mind, and yet we're not totally clear on the system from how we can measure it just quite yet. But as first person investigators of our own experience, we can really learn about our subtle body through meditation, through noticing what is the imprint or residue of our emotions in our body. So with that, I will go ahead and get us started on a practice. We'll leave time after for your questions in chat, and then we will guide you through a bit of instruction from Sukhni Rinpoche in how to work with some of our emotions in this time. So it's so important for us, especially at this later hour of the day, to find a posture that can really, su really support our practice. Sukhni Rinpoche often reminds students that we can have a lot of clarity, a lot of strength, right alongside our relaxation. And that our relaxation doesn't have to be soft and fuzzy and diffuse. Our relaxation can be bright. So let's find a posture that can really support that, feeling the strength and a brightness of our spine. Finding a way in which our head can rest gently with a gaze slightly down, whether eyes are closed or open. And then finding that softness and that ease through the muscles in the face, the throat, the chest, and the belly. And for a couple preliminary breaths here, gift yourself your full attention to the breathing body. And for many of us at the end of the day, our attention can be a bit loose, diffuse, distracted. So let's give ourselves the anchor of sound wherever we are in our home. Notice the sounds. And let the noticing of this sound really have that same balanced level of attention where it's clear and vivid. We're noting precisely as the sounds begin and end, but also gently, not leaning ahead towards whatever sound may next arise, just gently receiving sound. Some of us may be fortunate to have almost no sound whatsoever. Notice the quality of silence. You may start to notice in the silence the sound of your own breath or heartbeat.
you may notice that the sounds are arising and falling away. And yet our noticing of sound remains steady and constant. And feel and really imagine the steadiness and the stillness of the mind. And at this point, you may have already noticed thoughts or mental images, ideas, planning or rumination, inserting themselves in here and there. And from this noticing of where the mind is right now, consider an intention for your practice. What would most serve you right now? This intention can be simple. I want to find simplicity. I want to feel connected. I want to be open. Just choose whatever is naturally arising and have that clear intention as a guiding light for the practice. And we'll gently transition now into the handshake practice. And this means at the very beginning, just dropping completely thoughts, images, ideas, all the activity of the thinking mind. Dropping it, letting it go as though you were letting go a stone. And bring the attention and your awareness instead to the realm of the feeling body. Of course, we notice some areas of the gross body of our warmth or weight. And in this practice, we look even a little deeper to this layer and level of subtle body. This is where we may find the residue of our emotions. Emotions from today, emotions from this month of quarantine, emotions from this lifetime of habitual patterns. So we allow ourselves to be open to whatever is arising in the field of this body. In the subtle body, we may notice just the most simple glimpse of something like dread or despair, irritation, loneliness. And as we shake hands with whatever is here, we just gently meet and notice the sensations associated with those emotions in the body. In this moment, uncertainty may be showing up like a semicircle of tension beneath the left breast or at the chest. Maybe we're finding that irritation is a looping spiral between our two eyes and eyebrows. Without thinking of the story of what might make us feel 
some despair or dread or frustration. Notice the felt sensations. If noticing the subtle body is not familiar to you, it may be hard to know what it is you're looking for. In this case, you could give yourself a simple example, remembering the last time that you read a challenging news article, or the last time you spoke with a friend who's going through a hard time, and just bringing that memory to mind may in and of itself ignite the emotional response. And we can notice then the cascading experience of that emotion in our body. And we release the memory entirely and focus on the sensations undulating and moving throughout the body. Feel or imagine as though there were enough space for whatever sensation arises. No need to push it away. Bringing your attention and awareness is bringing kindness to these sensations. You may find that your mind easily gets caught up wanting to be entertained by a thought, a memory, or an image. And just keep bringing yourself back, dropping all mental thoughts, feelings. And coming into the space of the body. Noticing the sensations associated with whatever these thoughts may have brought and stirred up. Or just noticing what is the actual residue of our 
current emotional state in the body right now. As we shake hands with our emotions, we may find they gently start to dissipate completely on their own accord. They leave and without a trace, we find their absence making more and more space for our subtle body to flow. We may find areas that are particularly blocked, maybe a tight knot of frustration or a heavy stone of sorrow. Just keep making space, keep noticing, keep inviting an unfolding of this knot with our kind, present attention. And in our last moments of practice here, we can investigate whether amid these sensations of the subtle body, is there something that feels okay or good? So we may have these knots or stuck areas. Maybe we find reprieve from some of them. But the invitation is, is there something behind, beneath, and in fact, all around, which is already good, already okay. Something in our basic okayness, which is actually surrounding any of these knots, larger than. Is there something here with uncontingent okayness? Not okay because some feeling that was hard went away, but just okay. Intrinsically, primordially okay. Thank you all for your practice. We would love for folks to share with us in the chat some questions about that practice. Uh, I know some of you um, who I've sat with many times are very familiar with that practice. There can still be questions, new questions. So I would love to hear from folks in the chat about what that was like. 
And feel free, of course, to move your body, to stand up for a moment, give yourself what you need. Find your cat. Chandra, as we're waiting to, oh, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> Claudia asks, what if it's a re reoccurring emotion? What to do with the triggers? So during the meditation itself, it keeps re-triggering. Yeah, you know, this is a really great training, actually, to notice how much our mind can, um, without our, our consciousness, without our control, re-trigger us. And so no problem if that keeps happening. Um, it's just a lot of information for us. And it means that we have momentarily actually, we have, we have exited the field of the subtle body and traveled back up into the mind. And so we can be aware of what that feels like um, and just immediately invite ourselves back and invite ourselves back very much like our mindfulness practice where we would, you know, release whatever has come to mind and come back to focus on the breath. And in this, we just release whatever is triggering us um, and come back to focus on the body. Um, that is, especially if we invite something, it can be very hard to let it go. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think, Chandra? Any other ideas with that? Well, I second that 100%. I I have definitely, you know, had to shake hands continually <laughs> through meditation. You know, it's like the constant handshake again and again. It's like you're developing a muscle and that's okay. You know, I, humor is always very helpful for me when I see that I'm doing this, you know, to have a light touch with it, even if it's a strong emotion, to have a sense of care and light uh, hearted um tenderness like I would a child that's always very helpful treating myself more as a as a tantruming flailing uh, you know angry little girl can be often an accurate um, illustration when I'm feeling something coming back coming back coming back again and that which we resist persists that's something I say a lot with the feeding your demons practice so if you're resisting it's actually going to persist Mm. So this turning towards and shaking hands is very similar to the alchemy of feeding your demons or Tonglen for that matter, sending and receiving, where we actually turn towards it and give it our attention, give it some space and give it some love. And slowly that repetitive compulsive ideation in Tibetan, it's called namtok. It's this mm -hmm. compulsive thinking of autopilot starts to quiet down and then we start to feel the bliss of being more in our subtle body which is very pleasant i see somebody did comment that they felt very relaxed and in the moment uh, what a gift you know it's wonderful when the mind can quiet down and the energy can move from the head center down into the lower centers of the heart and the belly in mm. particular mm. Uh, we had a, another question here um, from Dean. I struggle with the somatic element. Um, as a psychotherapist, I go towards the head. Yes, you are not alone, Dean. Um, <laughs> and, you know, one thing I, I suggest is, um, you know, for all meditation, and this one as well, is this doesn't need to be an on-the-cushion practice. So if it's harder to um, maybe kind of, uh, generate that interest in the body as we're here sitting. Maybe notice exactly the next time you bring your phone to <laughs> look at that news article. In that moment, of course there's things in the head, but notice the body and give yourself that pause. Same when it's something nice, like right when you, you know, turn on the shower and step in and feel the goodness of being in the shower. Notice what is that like, not just the physical body, but what is the, you know, the goodness feeling so we can kind of train ourselves towards that. Um, yeah, it's really, it is really challenging to not go to the narrative and to the story. Um, and yet that physiological arousal of our emotion is very real. 
Um, and it doesn't necessarily need to persist if we aren't re-triggering it with our thoughts. So that's the training. So sometimes reminding ourselves of why too. It's like, oh yeah, sensations in my body, whatever. But the real action is in my head, I'll figure it out. And yet what we, we know, most of us from first person experience is thinking about our emotion while we are emotional is gasoline on a fire. And in fact, the best thing we could possibly do is reorient back to the body, noticing sensation and giving ourselves space. So I hope that's motivation. Okay, now we're getting quite a few questions. Any pop out for you, Chandra, here? Yeah, one of them is um, someone kindly saying, thank you, teachers. I find <laughs> that once I've settled into the body significantly, there's really a lot of sensation. Sometimes it can be hard to not kind of be lost in the arising, passing change of all the sensations. Yes, and it's great to acknowledge that. And sometimes sensations can be quite strong and can pull us out of the mm -hmm. task at hand, so to speak, whether it's mindfulness of the breath, as Eve said, or mindfulness of the subtle body, which is more of the focus of this practice. And so in a sense, the focus of this practice is of the ever-changing uh, sensation. So it can be a little bit, I would say more of like an intermediate level practice because and the breath in a way is like that as well. It's always changing. It's not a static thing. But when we feel an intensification of sensation, what I would say is to lean back a bit mm -hmm. more in your awareness. So it's like sitting back in your seat and observe those sensations more like you would observe a play being played out on a stage. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful analogy that helps me a lot. So in a sense, we're, we're, we're like a witness of the play of sensations that are arising and passing, whether it's physical, mental, emotional, there's a quality of stabilizing in the presence, the capacity to be present with, to watch, to attend to these sensations in a way that's alert and um, wakeful. Not, I liked how Eve, you mentioned this in the beginning, you know, you can be relaxed without being uh, dull. There can be a wakeful stability coinciding with the experience of relaxation. Mm -hmm. And so this also comes into play here. And one thing that one of our mentors often says, Alan Wallace, who teaches more of a Dzogchen experience of shamatha, calm abiding, which is very much like the pasana, breath awareness, stabilizing meditation. We, there's more nuance to that, but I'll leave it at that. In any case, it's it's not about fixing yourself so that you have this perfect experience of stability, clarity, wakefulness, concentration, relaxation, and someday you're going to be there. And most of the time we're just trying to climb that rock cliff and get there. This The practice that is more aligned with what Sogni Rinpoche says is more of a Dzogchen, which means great perfection. It's a Tibetan Buddhist uh, approach to meditation where we are actually observing all appearances, whether it's fatigue, anger, intense sensation, preference, desire, fear, whatever it is that's arising in you, arise that as if it's arising within the space of your mind and stabilize your mind body and stabilize that experience of space within which all of those myriad of appearances arise. It's very different than trying to control the environment. <laughs> and I find it very liberating and it can help when you're having waves of bliss or extreme fatigue where you wanna lie down, you feel like you can't sit up any longer. Mm. Let the fatigue be within that space of awareness without needing to change it or fix mm. it. Let the bliss or sensations be there without needing to change it or fix it. Mm. Yeah, I hope that's uh, helpful. I found that enormously helpful. <laughs> um, I want to, I just want to mention a name. Um, uh, I hope I pronounce this right. Jaya, who sent, you know, that this is a powerful practice right now. Um, and that th there's a feeling of separation grief, um, even though they live in a physically connected community, which I find interesting. Um, because then I'm going to jump to the um, last comment right now um, from Eric, in which, um, in a different experience, Eric describes finding it exhausting to provide the only compassionate connection right now. 
Um, so living alone, that sense of endless isolation um, is difficult to not get lost in. Um, so that can, you know, have a real sense of fatigue. And I think what Chandra said uh, relates to that um, and relates to that very core and sometimes annoying uh, refrain that we hear in the teachings a lot, which is, you know, there is the pain and then there is the suffering. And we have to let our, our pain be. The pain of physical isolation is incredibly real. Incredibly real. The suffering of it being endless and us being alone and the added mental elaboration, that it is said is optional and nonetheless painful. Um, and we'll talk about this a bit more today in terms of really getting a sense of noticing are we reacting out of our habitual patterns or are we reacting to what's here right now? Um, yet in this case, with the reality of kind of an, an endless feeling of isolation, that is a very real pain. But I, I would wonder or inquire um, from what Eric shared of where can we in some ways kind of lay down or let down or let be that extra layer of God, it's endless and I, I wish it was different. Um, and I think handshake can be really beautiful to help us um, open up to and also see the, um, the changing nature of those feelings. So especially when we feel this you know, intense isolation and um, for some of us grief around that, it can feel as though it's just this solid wall of grief. I am sad and that's all I feel. And yet if we investigate closer, our emotions do come and go they slightly shift and change. And that, as we start to notice, they may only feel like, I guess this moment isn't quite as sad as that one a couple ago, right? We may not feel a huge difference, but we can attend closely to how our emotions are shifting because they are not permanent. They are ever-changing, and that gives us a chance to inhale and exhale and make space around. At the very end of that practice, I, I highlighted us towards one of the main teachings that Sukhni Rinpoche uh, reveals in this book, and that's one of our basic okayness, he says. Goodness, for some of us, maybe that's a, a high bar, but at a basic level, we are okay. There's an okayness. Another person noticed that um, when they dropped thinking and were staying with the subtle energy, they felt warm and pleasant. So there's like a, when we start looking and paying close attention to what is happening amid these emotions, we may find that goodness. And it is no, um, it is by no means to say that um, it's a replacement for being with other people. That's not true. Um, and yet there is, um, there are ways to interrogate some of that additional suffering that we're placing on our pain right now. I also, Chandra, wonder if you have other recommendations for that. Um, no, I feel that's that's great. Yes, thank you. Okay, just seeing. I think. Yeah, so. Yeah, I think we we got to all of our our yeah. questions here. Yeah. So now we'd like to dive into the book, and before we dive into the book, we want to dive into who wrote the book. <laughs> So the author is a very uh, wonderful teacher who some of you may know. Uh, as uh, Eve mentioned, he has an interesting name. It's Tsok Nyi Rinpoche. And um, in my past life, meaning, you know, before I had kids, I was a Tibetan translator. <laughs> so I know a bit of language details. And it's an interesting name because Tsok Nyi, Tsok is a word that means accumulation. It can be also a word for like a puja, where you do a, you gather together, you accumulate people and food and wine. And it, it's actually a very beautiful uh, ritual in Tibetan Buddhism called sok. It means accumulation. Then nyi means two. And then rinpoche means precious jewel. And so rinpoche is like a common epithet. It's a common title for, for high lamas. Tolkus, reincarnated beings who are, who, who um, have come back to help us out. <laughs> they haven't just escaped to Nirvana, but they actually chose to come back. So he's one of them. So we're very grateful. 
and uh, he's teaching and writing books. But what are the two accumulations? The two accumulations, the Tsokni that he's named after, are the accumulations of merit and wisdom. So on the path of, of Vajrayana, Mahayana, these kind of middle and later phases of Buddhism, it's said that we can move more closely to realization, to our own awakening, by one, cultivating momentum through good acts, through good deeds, through ethics, through kindness, generosity, through practice. And this is done, this is merit. It's like, you know, it's like Lama Tsultra, my teacher says this, it's pretty funny. She says, you know, when you plug in your iPhone, if you've got an iPhone, maybe the Androids and other phones do this too. But when you plug in the iPhone, it kind of goes, <laughs> that's that feeling of getting charged up that you've, you've, you know, when you've said something nice or you've given a gift, you get this, this feeling of upliftment, of charge, of good energy. So merit is like this, mo this energy that we can accumulate through the six perfections, actually, what um, Eve highlighted five of the six perfections in her intro talk about how to be um, a good citizen on Zoom and um, a, a Dharma citizen. But these are all practices that uh, Buddhists enact, that they put into their life so that they can move, you know, generate. It's like filling up your tank full of gas. It's hard to go anywhere if you don't have any gas. It's hard to move in a direction if you don't have the wind in your sails. So merit is that wind in your sails towards an awakening. And then wisdom is the word prajna, which means in Sanskrit is wisdom. It's it's practice study the head and the heart integrating so that you have an inner experience of your own innate truth and wisdom and so it's through that cultivation of really the body mind which is linked together through the subtle body we felt that hopefully a little bit today tonight is is a way to um, wake up to your true nature to really open to your own truth and so that is the experience of wisdom or prajna. And so what a profound teaching his name is. I mean, we don't even have to read the book. We just think about the meaning of his name. <laughs> and so really these two accumulations of merit and wisdom are a precious jewel, Rinpoche. And so he is embodying that through his teachings, of course. So it's a beautiful name and it's a name I had never heard before. It's not a common name. So I thought it'd be nice to to give you a little commentary, because a lot of people know him, but don't really know what his name means. <laughs> so he was born in 1966 in Nubri, Nepal. I believe that's northern Nepal. A lot of Tibetan refugees came out of Tibet during the diaspora of the 50s and 60s, and settled in Nepal and India, of course, and Bhutan as well, Sikkim. So Tsokni Rinpoche was actually born in Nepal because his parents had to escape the Chinese communist invasion of Tibet in 1959. And 66 is, is seven years later. Uh, this, his father was a very well-known teacher named Toku Orgyen Rinpoche, who taught widely, became very beloved within the Western kind of you know, the hippie culture going to India and Nepal, studying Dharma. He was really one of the foremost translators of Dharma for the West. He wrote many books. His name is Toku Urgen. And he wrote one of my favorite memoirs is called Blazing Splendor. It's the memoirs, it's a little weird reflection, but the book looks like this. It's uh, the memoirs of Toku Urgen, great read, wild stories of old Tibet. Just if you're interested in that, it's really interesting. And, um, and so Tsokni Rinpoche, along with his brother Mingyur Rinpoche, and um, oh, there's another prominent teacher, and I'm blanking on his name. There are three Tok brothers. Tok uh, Nima Rinpoche. Yeah, uh, Toku Nima, what did you say? Uh, Choki Nima. Choki Nima, right. Choki Nima Rinpoche, who founded a, a very important Buddhist uh, study university and monastery in Nepal. And so in any case, these three brothers uh, grew up in Nepal, were raised by the, the, their Dharma parents. And Tsogi Rinpoche also is not just a monastic, he's also married and has two, two daughters. So he's a father. 
which I think helps to make his teachings uh, understandable and um, accessible for most of us. He also oversees nunneries in Nepal and Tibet. So he's an advocate for women and education of the nuns, which is actually used to not be a very strong suit in Tibetan Buddhism. So I appreciate that as well. He's one of the foremost Dzogchen teachers who really bridged uh, uh, the Vipassana wave of popularity through Spirit Rock, IMS. He became a teacher to many of those teachers, like the Jack Cornfields, the um, Tara Brocks, a lot of these Vipassana-based teachers. He taught them Tibetan Buddhism and helped to adapt and make that understandable. Uh, primarily the teachings of Dzogchen, which are, that means the great perfection. So Tsokni Rinpoche is well known for that. My parents actually studied with his father. I think we even hosted him at our house when I was a little girl. I don't remember, but I believe my mom did say that. But I've never met Tsokni Rinpoche. Um, I have a, of a sweet YouTube talk that he gave that I'll post in the chat function uh, while Eve shares a bit of her experiences about Tsokni as well. Yeah, just just briefly, he's um, he's hilarious. Um, so I really recommend watching this YouTube. I just find his humor to be just such a relief um, and so inviting. I heard about his practices for the first time through some Dharma friends, um, probably back in 2012. Um, and he has this practice, which I will describe briefly tonight um, around what it is to have emotions that are real but not true. Um, and it has been such a supportive practice for me all these years. And I've gotten to sit with him in retreat a number of times and um, just delighted in him as a human being. Professionally, we, um, we got to spend a little time together uh, teaching uh, internationally last year, if you would believe it, at the World Economic Forum in Davos. These things happen. Um, I had the audacity to invite him and happily he joined. Uh, we did compassion workshop and um, it was very challenging for me to keep my cool because I am such a big fan and admire her. And he just embodies his teachings. He is so relaxed and at ease and yet so sharp and precise. Uh, so yeah, just really delighted that we uh, Chandra and I have been thinking about which book to read and what we choose. We really want something that's accessible and psychologically relevant. I love a lot of the ancient teachings and books and they are just um, sometimes feel very remote and removed um, from a lot of the language which most of us are familiar with in terms of understanding and applying. And this book, uh, just like Beyond Religion that we had before, in its simplicity, it hits great dharma. So without further ado, we will start our commentary on this first part of the book. So the first chapter is a beautiful chapter. I've read it a few times now, and I really enjoyed going back and thinking about the topics that he brings up. Um, it's called The Bridge, and he talks about, he opens with this section uh, talking about an experience that he had walking across two skyscrapers on a glass bridge and how terrified he was paralyzed with fear and so he breaks this experience down in so many beautiful ways and talks about what is fear how it can be real but not true which is something Eve will talk about in a little bit but how do we shake hands with something like fear, paralyzing fear? And so this chapter does a beautiful job at unpacking that. And so I'd like to kick it off and then Eve will take it over. So fear, fear, this fear image of him walking across this glass bridge, like my, my palms and soles of my feet are sweating right now. Like if I just think about that, I'm, <laughs> I'm feeling it. And I'm, I used to climb rocks, you know, I was a rock climber. Uh, but there's this palpable feeling of fear. And so we can feel fear in many different ways. And he's particularly talking about this kind of paralyzing fear. Like he couldn't walk. He had to pull back and really breathe and think like, what is going on? And this caused him to investigate why he was fearful. And he remembered that in his childhood that he used to climb trees a lot. And then he fell 
a few times and got hurt. And so then heights became associated with pain. And so his body retracted and no longer wanted to do that. And so he had internalized that. So he had investigated what was the cause of that strong paralyzing reaction of fear. And he was able to trace it back to something in his childhood, which is very common. I think that we can all identify with that. So none of us are immune to fear. I mean, we can feel it in so many different ways. Uh, the Buddha taught that at the base, all beings experience a state of anxiety fed by our habit of resisting the changing and permanent nature of our existence. So meaning that the sheer basic truth that life is ever changing and that impermanence is really the only permanent thing, <laughs> that this is frightening to us because there's a part of our ego, of our sense of safety that wants things to stay the same. We are either, if we like it, we want it to stay the same. If we don't like it, we want to change. But in either case, there's a reaction and a clinging that's involved with that. And that that flavors our, our life with a quality of this kind of undercurrent or an underbelly of anxiety flavored with fear. Another way of saying it is it's like an ex existential fear of death. Of course, walking across a glass bridge definitely is a very um, strong correlation to just the sheer fear of death. But fear also manifests as fear of not being loved. We can experience fear in so many different ways. Fear of not being good enough. Let's all just put our hands on our hearts and, you know, tap it, handshake it, whatever, <laughs> hug it. You know, we can elbow bump it because, of course, shaking hands <laughs> is uh, not, not a thing right now. Um, fear of making a mistake. Fear of illness. Fear of the COVID virus. That's a real fear. Fear of failure. Fear of losing our job. Fear of the unknown. Fear of heights. Fear of flying. All of this, in a sense, all of these things attack our small sense of self, right? Oh, if I'm not loved, if I'm not good enough, then I won't be loved. That's a fear of not being loved. And it comes from more of like the vantage point of the small self, right? Fear of separation. Sometimes, of course, it goes without saying, fear is a good thing. We need it to stay safe. We need it to stay alert. That's biologically, we have that within us for a good reason. But we need to be able to recognize when we don't need to be in that heightened state of fear, that fight or flight state. So like um, uh, Tsogni Rinpoche, that fear, he realized that fear may be real, but not necessarily true. And so in the next section, he talks about waking up. It's so interesting. Waking up from the dream. So of course, we've all had the experience where we've been in a dream, we're sleeping, we're dreaming. And then when we wake up in the morning, we realize, okay, that wasn't real. That was just a dream. But what about the waking dream? They call it in Buddhism, the waking dream. Our daytime experiences are like a waking dream, it said. And really what it is, is this dream of conditioned reality. If this dream of the waking dream, our experience even right now, is like the dream of conventional reality. We're engaged with, we're rea reacting to, we're believing in the way things appear. But we have to, as, as investigators, as first person investigators, I like how Eve says that, we have to also question now, are appearances real? Maybe they're real, but are they true? Oftentimes we have our own perspective of things. We think, oh, well that really happened that way, but the other person experienced it totally different. So what's the truth in that? Is there really an objective truth out there? I want to read a quotation from a really sweet little book by Toku Urgen, Tsokni Rinpoche's uh, dad. It's 
called Vajra Speech, and I'm reading from page 53 of Vajra Speech. It's a wonderful publication of many different uh, quotations from his teachings. This one's very concise. The word for dream in Tibetan is milam, milam. He says, not recognizing mind essence is the same as dreaming. So that means that as long as we haven't dropped in and drunk from the wellspring of our true nature, our deep, they can, you could call it Buddha nature, but our true basic goodness, then we are living in a, in a way, an illusion that is conditioned by our karma, by our environment, by our memories, our perceptions. He says, dreaming is not primordial. It is momentary. So what he means is that our essence is primordial. So as long as we're in the dream, we're momentary. And recognizing this is what's called vipassana, clear insight, deep insight into the way things are, momentary, interdependent, ever-changing. And at the depth, our Buddha nature, this experience of oneness, of enlightenment, transcends that momentary, ever-changing experience. So not recognizing mind essence is the same as dreaming. So think about that. I just want to plant that seed, even if this is new to you and it might be like, what is she talking about? <laughs> Start to contemplate for yourself, and this will be a question I'm posing to you right now, and you can actually chat any answers or observations. When in your life have you recognized that you were dreaming in the waking state? When in your life did you have a moment where you realized, oh my God, I was lost in thought, lost in fantasy, lost in projection, assumption, so bogged down in my fear that I couldn't see clearly. And then there's a moment of clarity. When in your life, if any, maybe it's right now. Did you have that experience of waking up from the waking dream? So I'm going to keep going, but you can type in any reflections uh, if you if you wish. So just a couple more moments here. Um, so uh, Tsogni Rinpoche also talks about this beautiful little section called spinning wheels. <clears throat> And he's, this is a play on words because the, what he's referring to is samsara, which in Sanskrit literally just means the turning wheel. The wheel or the cycle of existence. And it's like when we're in samsara, when we're in the dream and believing the dream to be real, we are in samsara. When we wake up from that dream and we recognize our essence, our mind essence as uh, Toko Urgen says, then we are in what is called nirvana. Nirvana is that state of awakening, of true perfection. It's like coming home. You're aligned with reality. Uh, really, nirvana literally means extinction, extinguished, but it's like the delusion is extinguished. And so what the Dzogchen teachers say, what the Tibetans often say is, Samsara and nirvana are not two different places. It's not like the world is samsara and somewhere out in the heaven realms is nirvana. The difference between the two is whether or not you have recognized your mind essence. If you haven't, if you're in a state of forgetting, you're in samsara. If you're in a state of remembering, you're in nirvana. So in terms of samsara, Tsogni Rinpoche says, samsara is often compared to a potter's wheel. A potter throws clay on a wheel and shapes it using his or her hands and a great deal of talent while typically continuing to spin the wheel in the same direction. 
Likewise, during the course of our own lives, many of us experience a sense of motion, a sense of making something or of making something happen. Unfortunately, as it turns out, what we end up doing is recycling the same old mental and emotional habits in different forms, using the same old technique of using whatever means are available to us to continue turning our mental and emotional potter's wheel. We keep thinking or feeling that this, is, this time, the result is going to be different. So this is this getting lost in sensations and thoughts over and over again. There's a certain point where we need to stop. And that, that, that entails some discipline. We can't just expect to be able to do that. And so I love that image of the potter's wheel, of the samsaras just going round and round and round. The same old habitual patterns. And the way that we can begin to stop the habitual turning is to do what Sogni Rinpoche did on that glass bridge, which is to trace back, why am I so afraid? Why are other people able to walk across this bridge and seemingly be without fear? And why am I paralyzed? And then through that understanding of understanding the causes and conditions, the root cause and the circumstantial conditions that gave rise to this fear, then he was able to unravel that and not be ruled by it. So yes, it's a process of inquiry, but it can also be very somatic. And so with that, I'd like to leave, leave, leave you in the beautiful, wonderful, wise hands of Eve. <laughs> Thank you. Cast all. Pass the wheel. Yes. Um, and we will, I, I see some great questions here too. I will leave some, a moment of time. I think just as what Chandra was sharing, um, we think about these habitual patterns or these ways of being, and especially with fear. For many of us, the fear that's happening right now, of course, it's unique and distinct. None of us have ever been through this. And yet there's a familiarity to how we are with our fear. And there might even be some familiar content with what is making us afraid right now. Are we most afraid of what's going on for us financially? Are we most afraid of what's going on for us relationally? There might be old stories. There might be old patterns. So as Chandra said, Sokni Rinpoche identifies that the fear that was preventing him from moving across this sky bridge was a fear that was very old, a very old story that he had been hurt. I'm sure none of us have old stories of being hurt, <laughs> right? Of course not. Um, and so how do we actually, first of all, identify what those stories are and then have what he calls the courage and the kindness to be with them. So it's really, if we think about this um, idea and we think about um, our patterns, he says that when he brings courage and kindness to them, that he has a shift in perspective that helps him more understand more deeply, not only how patterns work, but also how we can learn to work with our patterns. He says one of the greatest obstacles we face is our tendency to surrender very quickly to various kinds of thought, feeling, and physical sensation, accepting them as truths that keep us from taking the very first step. And I really enjoy how much he highlights that you know, a lot of our feeling of fear, we just, we kind of actually succumb to it or surrender. We just don't want to do that anymore. And that is sometimes enormously wise, but only, um, as this refrain says, if that fear is real and true. So right now, many of us are afraid, rightfully, that we could become infected um, by this um, illness and it could be harmful to our own health or harmful to our loved ones. So that is a fear that is real and that is true. There is an actual threat out there. But my, many of the times our fear, it, it feels just as real and just as threatening as this illness, as this virus. But it's not actually true. It's an old story. So heartbreak is such a great one to explore our delusions, our projections, and our habitual patterns. We have our heart broken. And in that moment, it is completely clear to us that we are unlovable and we will never love again. That feels so real, 
But if we investigate with courage and kindness, is this actually true? We might actually find that it's based on other ideas, old habits where we felt rejected when we were young or felt rejected another time. And so the idea here isn't that we kind of tell ourselves firmly, like, stop that thinking. Come on, you're going to get over this. Go out there. That like works maybe for the first half of the day. And then you succumb to <laughs> tears and fear and it's just over. And so what Sokni Rinpoche um, has said before is we actually have to send a message, as he says, from our prefrontal cortex to our amygdala, but it has to be wrapped in a lotus leaf of love. So that we can't just send that message of kindness and care in a very direct and conceptual way. That sometimes it has to be one that is just of holding, actually holding ourself, whether we're holding ourselves in love through the handshake practice, or we actually think of a holding ourselves. And as Chandra mentioned, holding ourselves as though we were that child crying out in the night. And we have to have as much patience as we would for a baby, <clears throat> not even a toddler, not even someone who could have the voice to tell you what's wrong. I'm afraid, I'm scared. No, just that kind of crying that we don't know how to soothe but we show up with completely with that kind of love. That is the tone at which we meet our fear. That's the internal tone. <clears throat> and so I think it's, um, it's really interesting to think about how do we do those steps of investigation? Well, we have to recognize right now, I'm afraid. Right now, is this fear both real and true in this moment? In this moment. Have I been hurt before? Yes. Is this moment right here, is this actually the exact same? So in Cultivating Emotional Balance, we call this our, our database of emotions. All of our accumulated life experiences that influence how we see the world and how we respond to the world. Um, and I think this idea of, of mantra or some kind of word that can help us is quite beautiful. Many of you are likely familiar with mantras. Some of you may have your own, um, but I love the way that he describes mantra here. He says, a mantra is basically a means of talking with your thoughts and feelings. It's a time-honored method referred to sometimes as prayer, but really it's opening a conversation between the heart and the mind. And, you know, with this mantra of, is this real and true? You can make it very personal. So this thought of fear arises and you ask the thought directly, are you real? Are you true? And he says that if you ask yourself again and again, if what your experience is, is real and true, until you can mentally and emotionally accept your feelings as real, but the conditions on which they're based as possibly not true, these momentary pauses can transform your understanding of who you are and what you're capable of. And in that same moment, encourage others to step on their own, same on their own bridges. So it's not just whether we can overcome that moment to moment fear. What he's suggesting here is how we respond to our fears is actually a big part of who we are and how we show up in the world. How we think of ourselves. Oh yeah, I'm not that kind of person who does that. No, no, that's not for me. We limit ourselves with those fears. So this really beautiful idea of by like moment by moment, having that courage and kindness to face directly what our fear is, to question it. Are you real and true? It doesn't just transform our experience in that moment. It can transform who we are. It can transform how we show up with others. And, um, you know, I think this is <laughs> especially true with fear. Fear is such a, an important emotion, of course. It's such a core emotion. And yet it's as though there was a smoke alarm going off in our own mind when we feel afraid. It is really hard to have access to any other kind of thought or feeling. And we need a pretty um, heavy duty tool, right? You know, if we wake up in the middle of the night and the smoke alarm's going off, we don't just like gently walk over and see if we have like the right thing to take it apart. We need to get there as quick as we can. Maybe not with a hammer, but something very strong. And this mantra is a very strong tool, very strong tool for us to use. Real, but not true, 
real but not true. And I think it can really take us quite far. And I would love to, in a very similar vein, as Chandra asked, is right now, right now, amid this pandemic, where we have many feelings, we have fear, we have grief, we have irritation, can you identify an emotion that is real but not true? And would you mind sharing it with us by chat of what is an emotion you're feeling is real but not true? I think unworthiness that I am alone. Yeah. How real does it feel when we feel unworthy? So real. And yet, I am 100% I am certain that there's actually no being for whom there's unworthiness. And that core belief that all of us have this basic goodness really supports that as well. Stuck. Um, so it's really, it's, it's interesting if we start taking um, to heart a lot of these ideas as well around if we are the product of our stuck patterns, maybe our, our some of these habits that prevent and start to kind of impede our fullness of being, that other people too, other people are also kind of acting out of these habitual patterns. One thing um, I'm seeing shame, shame is a, a huge real but not true one, because with shame often we have this sense of um, there's absolutely something fundamentally wrong with me and if other people knew they wouldn't want to be near me at all. Um, and it's so opaque. It just is like very hard to get in there. I see worry, overwhelmed and anxious, deep grief that there's no answer. Yeah. Yeah. Selfish. And I think with, you know, I've been, I've been working quite a lot with uh, healthcare professionals and, you know, I shared this yesterday and I think it's, it's worth sharing. I am working with frontline healthcare providers here in San Francisco and some of them feel guilty that they're not doing enough. So I think that's like a good reminder <laughs> for all of us, right? Because they think, well, my colleagues in New York, my God, they're doing so much more. So to really take in that, okay, their feeling of guilt in that moment is real. They feel bad. Is it true? No, right? And most of the time we are operating with these very old ancient systems um, of belief, these internal working models of who we are that are accumulated from our, you know, our parents, God bless them, they tried or didn't, but we interpreted things in often not the clearest ways, then our early relationships with others, and then every experience up until this moment where we can really, really fall into, as Chandra put it, this delusion about how life is and what life is. Um, and there was such a beautiful um, question up here of what is the difference between samsara and nirvana? Um, and it's really, they are, they're, they're really close, <laughs> right? It's not as though we reach nirvana and it's like this bliss realm per se. I, I know we'd like to believe that. Um, it's just that we are awake to the delusions, not meaning they're gone but we aren't so trapped by them. And that should be an encouraging message. That it's not that we're, we, the state we wanna be of Nirvana is so far away and we are way over here. We're already there. We're just kind of sleeping. We have to wake up and wake up. And we've all had a glimpse of that in the moment when you wake up and recognize, wow, I'm okay right now. I'm, I'm totally, like without anything from the outside, I'm okay. That's a glimpse of nirvana. It's quite simple and beautiful. Um, looking here, the more worry, not doing enough to help, unappreciated. Someone wrote, not sharing. Oh, so the mantra for this, uh, thank you for the question, is real but not true. Real but not true. And we use that as a questioning. Um, and the questioning form is, is this real and true? And the, the real here, again, is the felt sensation of fear 
is very real. The felt sensation of not doing enough, of grief, of shame, of being unappreciated, very real, meaning we're having an emotional response physiologically, psychologically. Is it true, meaning is it based in the reality of this moment or using old data, antiquated ideas? So that's how we apply real but not true. Um, yeah, so I think, yeah, I mean, I'm just enjoying hearing from you all, um, seeing the real but not true, um, and thinking of, you know, how we can hopefully carry this forward a bit into our day, our day to day. We probably even have enough time tonight before bed to do some real but not true questioning on our feeling. Um, I know for myself that um, sleep and bedtime actually has been a really hard time for me to work with my fear and that that has really right in that moment arisen. And it's a very felt sense. Our fear doesn't even need to have words. It's not like you could lose your job or what's going to happen next week. It could be just this felt experience that feels quite bright and for me really bright and energetic right when I want to feel sleepy and calm. And that moment can just say, oh, wow, this feeling is so real. Is there any truth here? And again, you know, really calling upon that, that lotus wrapped message from the prefrontal cortex to the amygdala or like you're holding the child, crying, crying child in the night. So not just asking ourselves the real but not true, but asking it in this way of so much kindness. That's what I encourage for you all. Um, and we would really, really love to see you all Saturday. Feel free to come, you know, for the morning and practice silent practice. We are going to encourage people to practice without their videos on, actually, so that you can do some really quiet introspective work. Uh, in the afternoon, we'll ask you to do a bit more engaged work. So if one of those sounds more appealing, you can come to either part of it. Um, yeah, and uh, so someone, just one more time, someone asked, how can a felt experience be not true? Um, it means that we can be triggered to our emotions, especially the intensity of them, based on memories. So for Sokni Rinpoche, the memory of fear of heights, or for me, the memory of heartbreak, right? Uh, so our emotions are based on perceptions and appraisals of the world unique to us. Um, so for Saturday, someone asked me to review the times. 10.30 until 12. 1.30 until 3.30. 30. Yes, that's it. Yeah. Um, thank you all so much. Chandra, can I ask you to close us with a dedication? Yes, and I just pasted the time frame for Saturday. I had oh, it in my notes, so I thought I'd share it with you all. Yeah, thank you, Eve. I so love hearing your interpretation of these timeless teachings, and I feel that it uh, really helps to bring it home and make it real and true. <laughs> <laughs> So let's just drop in and feel, feel ourselves in our body with our belly and breath. And trusting in your own intelligence, your own intuitive knowing that you are enough as you are. There's nothing you have to do or become in order to be loved and be full and whole. And these ways of coming back to the causes and conditions of our kind of habitual patterns is a path home towards healing. And recognize that we embark on that path for our own healing, yes, but also for the healing of the world, for those around us. And if you wish, take a moment to reach down and touch the earth like the Buddha did to claim your space. It's, he did it with his right hand. It's called the Bhumi Sparsha Mudra. It's touching the earth mudra. Just reaches down past your right knee and touch the earth and claim your space. You've earned this. You belong here.
And I'm remembering that there was an earthquake this morning in Los Angeles. So we can feel that as an, a validation of the earth saying, yes, this is true. And we dedicate the merit of our time together as one of these two accumulations of merit and wisdom. We don't keep that merit just for ourselves, but we increase it beyond, um, beyond measure by offering it up and giving it away. You can imagine this positive merit of our time together like a drop of water dropping into the vast ocean of positive energy of merit. It becomes limitless as we offer it and let go. Thank you. And if we don't see you on Saturday, one of us will be the guide for next week. This class happens every week, 7.30 Pacific time. It's either Eve or I or both of us when we're lucky and we can be together.